It's another study with fibromyalgia where they documented decrease, d decrease oxygen in the muscles in people with fibromyalgia versus a control group. So again, supporting this theory of how it works. We also know that in fibromyalgia, if you block the autonomic nervous system, the pain can get better. And the autonomic nervous system, as I mentioned, is how is the connection between the brain and the body. This was another study that was fascinating because what they found is that <coughs> people had repressive coping styles. So what's repression? What's repressive coping styles? One of the ladies in my, uh, one of these classes that I taught a few months ago uh, was sitting around the uh, uh, dinner table one day when she was a child. Her younger brother said, hey mom, do you know what that, uh, that priest did to me today? And she goes, Mom, he did that to me too. And the mom says, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. I don't ever want to hear about this again. That's repression, okay? <laughs> a very serious and situation, obviously. But repressive coping styles means where we try to submerge things. We don't deal with them. We don't think about them. We push them down and we push them in. And in people like that, what, they, what this study found was that these folks had lower levels of anxiety but higher levels of physical distress. So the pushing down of, the, of our emotional distress comes out in the body. And that's what TMS is. And we know from a whole variety of studies that our mood, our relationships, conflict in our relationships is related to the immune system. We know that immune dysfunction occurs when when we're more stressed. So that's well known. So TMS is universal. Everyone has blushing, their face gets red when, when we're embarrassed. That's a mind-body reaction. Everyone has, how many people have, uh, get headaches when they're stressed? You have a stressful day, you might have a headache. That's a mind-body reaction. And what TMS is, is really just an extension of that that begins to occur more chronically, begins to occur to the point where we need to do something about it. It's not a demonstration of mental illness. It's a demonstration of how we're constructed, of how human beings are with the connections between the mind and the body. So there's three different parts to the mind. The conscious mind that we're aware of, the subconscious mind, which is the autonomic nervous system, which controls our blood pressure and our heart rate and our breathing and, and things like that, and the unconscious mind, which is thoughts and feelings that we're not aware of. And that's what we're going to talk about now, the thoughts and feelings that we're not aware of, which uh, is what produces the physical symptoms of TMS. Now this was amazing to me to realize that most of what we think, most of our thoughts and feelings, we're not aware of. This is from neurologists telling us this. This is not new age woo woo folks. And there's a neural code, a pathway for all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, whether they're conscious or unconscious. They affect us. And this is, this was brought home to me uh, a few months ago when I was walking through my kitchen and all of a sudden my back seized up. I had pain in my back in four different spots, like that. And I was just walking through my kitchen. And so I stopped to try to figure out what was going on. I knew I hadn't hurt myself. So I said to myself, well, what was I thinking of? And my first thought was nothing. I wasn't thinking of anything. I was just walking through the kitchen. And then I said, okay, well, what you're really thinking about? What was going on? And all of a sudden it came to me that I was thinking about a conflict I was having with my teenage son. It's amazing. That I wasn't aware of what I was thinking, but yet my body had reacted to something I wasn't even aware of. And as soon as I recognized it, and I realized that I was fine, the pain went away. This is a demonstration of the unconscious mind. Are you familiar with the game Tetris? It's a video game where these 
shapes come down on the on the screen on the computer screen, and you have to move your the keys to make it uh, to make this, the squares and the shapes go in the right order and the right direction. On the left, you see a young person learning to play te Tetris. His mind is very active. You see all the red and the yellow, where all these different parts of the mind are lighting up that he's using to learn to play this game. And on the, uh, on the right there, you see the same person playing the same game at a much higher level six weeks later. Why isn't his mind all lit, lit up? He's not even doing anything. He's just unconsciously moving the things because he understands where they go and how it works. Have you ever driven somewhere and you got there and you didn't recognize how you got there? You weren't even aware of driving somewhere? That's the unconscious mind. You didn't get in an accident. Your unconscious mind was doing all the things. How do we walk? How do we chew gum? How do we, how do we find our mouth with the fork every day? All these things are just patterned in, patterned into our unconscious. But it's not only motor things that are patterned in, but it's also emotional things that are patterned in. How many times have you met someone who you had an immediate, immediate dislike for, you never met before? Why is that? Or an immediate like for, someone you found very, you were very attracted to. Usually it's because of your unconscious mind linking them to something from your past. Linking some part of them, their hair, their, their, their smile, their tone, how they look, or something that relates to somebody you either liked or disliked. And that's how the unconscious mind works. Emotions live in the unconscious as well. And emotional memories are forever. The emotions that we feel and grow up with live in a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is closely tied to the autonomic nervous system in the hypothalamus. The hippocampus is where most normal memories occur, but in the amygdala is where our emotional memories occur. And these emotional memories cause, re cause reactions in our bodies. It's irrational, it's unconscious, but it's very real. This is an interesting study which looked at uh, lab animals that were stressed compared to a group of lab animals that were not stressed in infancy. They found that those that were stressed in infancy were more likely to have overreactions later in life to various stressors. And so when you think about those kids and a lot of us who grew up with emotional memories, who grew up with emotional traumas, who grew up with bullying or abuse or whatever, and our reactions later in life are often overreactions. And they even found patterns of vasoconstriction, exactly what we're talking about causing TMS in these animal models who had stressors in, in their infancy. Now let's talk about pain for a minute. Pain is a learned response. We develop pain memories. We learn how to have pain. We learn how to have certain abdominal pains or bladder pains or headaches or neck pains. And it turns out that the body can produce pains in one area and not another area. Why do I get, when I'm stressed, why do I get pain that shoots down my left arm? And other people get headaches or other people get stomach pain or low back pain. We don't know exactly why, but we do know the body is capable of producing pain in different areas. And sometimes in the same person at different areas, one day to the next. A lot of times I see where people come in with the pain and then after a while it moves to another area and another area. And I'm glad because I say, you got it on the run now. You know, it's moving. And it turns out that fMRI studies, functional imaging of the brain, can show where the pain is in the brain. And so we realize that all pain has a component in the brain. And anticipation of pain can make it worse. And they found that when they, when they give people an explanation for why they're having a certain pain, the pain reduces. And they can see that, that lighting up of the pain center in the brain reducing. And that's what we're going to do as part of this class, is we help you understand what is the cause of the pain. And as you change your understanding of it, that will help to reduce the pain. This is an amazing experiment where they took people and they, put it, they gave them this uh, little bracelet that had electric charge to it. 
and uh, they gave them a shock and they were scanning their brain at the same time but what they would do is they would go ready set and then they would give them the shock and when they were ready set a certain part of the brain lit up which was the anticipation center of the brain and then when they got the shock there was another part of the brain that lit up which was the sensory center where they felt the pain in the brain and then they said, okay, now we're going to give you an anesthetic cream. We're going to put this cream on, and then we'll put the bracelet on, and we're going to give you the shock again. But you probably won't feel it as much. Why? Because you've got this anesthetic cream on. But what was the experiment? Fake cream, right? Not real anesthetic cream. Placebo cream. Just cream. So now what they do is they go ready, set, and as they go ready, set, they're scanning the, the brain, and what does the brain show? not as much activity because they're not anticipating as much pain as before because they know they have the anesthetic cream. And then it goes shock and they give them the exact same amount of shock they had before but guess what? The brain shows less pain and they report less pain. So the anticipation of what we expect to happen is critical in what happens in our lives. And all pain has the, a sensory component, what we feel. It also has a cognitive component that I was talking about in the sense of what we think it is and what we think is going to happen to it. But it also has an affective component, meaning the emotions around it. And as we have pain or symptoms, if our emotions are tied up with that, if our emotions kick in, if we get fr afraid, if we get worried, if we feel like it's never going to go away and we're doomed, those emotions make the pain worse. And so our treatment that we're going to do as part of this program is changing our understanding of the symptoms, changing our, our reaction to the symptoms, changing our emotions about the symptoms, and that's part of the way that we change the symptoms themselves. Because these are the cause of the symptoms. They're coming, the symptoms are coming from, as I said before, our minds.